Revelation chapter 2. Before we start tonight, I'd like to say, uh, how many can get the, let me ask, how many can get the podcast? The podcast. You need to get, get on the podcast and listen to the Revelation overview that we gave a month or two ago. It was an hour long, but I covered the whole book, and that would help you understand, uh, I think, what we're dissecting now. So our purpose in these uh, sessions in the next month or two is to go verse by verse and talk a little bit about each verse so it's not an overview. All right. Now, if you've got your Bibles tonight, and praise the Lord, we'll see if we can get it started here. Let's just go to Romans, or I'll get it right, Revelations. Revelation, not Revelations. Get rid of this slang, right? Before we start reading in chapter 2 and verse 1, let me read you a little something I had on note here that we made for the Africans, it's applicable tonight. Chapter 2 and 3 deal with seven literal churches in John's day and also reveal certain characteristics, or we could say attributes, both good and bad, involving the church age that we live in. This began with Pentecost and will end at the rapture. The coming great tribulation saints will be exactly that and will not take part in the church as we understand it. Some believe that we're living in the lukewarm church, which is the seventh church that Jesus spoke about. But uh, I'm not going to argue with it because I would say to a point the church is lukewarm. But on the other hand, the remnant church is overcoming, so we can't say they're lukewarm. So People take these seven churches, as you know, Brother Monty, and they try to make seven periods of time in sequence and putting us in the last church or the seventh church, which the way we see it is that there were seven literal churches with problems, but those good and bad aspects are for today also. Right. Any, any church could fall under one of those seven uh, examples that are given by those seven churches, just depending on their... Yeah their pastor and, and their, their spiritual position and, and, and the con spiritual position of the congregation. Okay. Did everybody hear him? Might want to get a little closer to the mic there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, um, before we start, the letter was written to each messenger in the church each pastor of the church. And this denotes authority of the pastor, but also he's the one catching it. Now, I want to say that again, because it's not just the church Jesus is getting on to here, but it's the pastor. And the pastor has some, somehow or another allowed these false doctrines into the church, and God is upset. He always finds something good to say, Thank God for that. But then he has something bad to say. The, the, the command was to every church, including the pastor, to repent for allowing such foolishness in the church. But we have the same false doctrines today to deal with, which lets me know the pastors are to blame. For the most part. Because they're not, they're not really preaching the word and, and holding out the false doctrines from the church. When false doctrine comes in, Jezebel's spirit gets in. Now we got Satan setting up headquarters in the church. In fact, there was one guy that was martyred, and that martyrdom occurred in the church. Now, what kind of church service is that? That's pretty sad. <laughs> well, it's it's the evidence is that the Muslims came in and destroyed them all. But we're going to try to be nice tonight, and just, we're going to start in verse 2 without rambling here too much. And I think I'll have Brother Monty read the first seven verses, and you can go along, and then we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, okay? Praise the Lord. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, 
These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Mm -hmm. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which mm -hmm. I also hate. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. That's the promise of the overcomer. Now let's go back to verse uh, 1, and it just simply implies that the pastors uh, belong to God. Amen. The pastors belong to God, and that's a good thing. Actually, we all do, but you understand the secrets of events here. And Jesus actually walks in the midst of these churches. And I think he walks in the midst of ours. He's not a respecter of persons, nor a respecter of New Testament churches. And I wonder what he could find wrong with us today. Well, it's in the Word. Okay, everybody say it's in the Word. It's in the word. Now the second verse uh, explains divine knowledge. And... This church apparently had departed from uh, sound doctrine. It seems like we're living in a time in this church age we live in that people don't want to hear about doctrine. They think it's some type of a curse word or something. And actually without sound doctrine we just can't have sound faith. No. They, they leave the doctrine behind. In fact some churches have even left the office of pastor behind. They just meet and whoever has a word gets up and teaches, and they don't have a leader, they don't have a pastor. Mm -hmm. and, but I believe these letters being written to these churches establishes the authority of the pastor over the church, that, that the pastor is one of the fivefold ministries given as a mm -hmm. gift unto the church. Yeah. So it can be a good thing to be a pastor, and it can be a bad thing. It just depends if you're called of God or not. But anyway, he always gives us all... God always gives us space to repent, doesn't He? Yes, He does. And He wants the church today to repent. Mm -hmm. So we want to liken this church, these seven churches, to historical churches, but also applicable to our setting today, because they are. Now in verse 3, this church uh, was diligent in their efforts, and they refused to quit. Now that's a good thing, not quitting, right? We haven't quit, have we? So that's a good thing. Now the fourth verse there, uh, they left their first love. Would you like to talk about what that actually means, Brother Money, leaving their first love? Well, they've, they, Christ is not first and foremost. They've gone on to other mm -hmm. doctrines, whether they be doctrines you know, from the Bible or doctrines of men, but they left the cross. They left the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So when a church receives a substitute way of salvation, our deliverance, then it's something other than Jesus and His cross. Or if they just start teaching some other doctrine and stop teaching mm -hmm. salvation. Prosperity, yeah. healing, if they, yeah. those are good doctrines, but if they do not teach salvation, repentance, and, and, and being born again, then those other doctrines are, are useless because they have no foundation to... to rest on. That's right. Uh, verse 5, uh, they've fallen from grace. Now I know that some churches say that you can't do that. A church can't do that. But the Bible says, what is it? Uh, verse 5, let me look at it again here. Yeah. Thou art fallen. Everybody see that? Remember where from whence thou art fallen and repent. So, are we going to say we can't fall? I mean, that's ridiculous because this church is in a fallen condition, but Jesus loves the church. See, that's the deal. 
But now he doesn't tolerate, you know, these things going on. He gives churches space to repent. Churches are made up of people, so he gives people time to repent and opportunity after opportunity. But there comes a time that the Lord gets upset. And we don't want that to happen to us now, do we? Amen. Certainly not. So they, they departed from grace. And they fell from grace and departed from Christ, I should say. Now that's a terrible thing because Paul warned us in Galatians that there would be another gospel and another Jesus preached. And he said, there is no other gospel and no other Jesus. All right. Now in verse 6, uh, that word, if I could see it here tonight, uh, Nicolaitans, Nicolaitanes, or have you pronounced that? Uh, they were laity conquerors. In other words, in the ministry we have what we call clergy, and that's the fivefold. Then we have the laity, which is the congregation. Okay? Not in the fivefold necessarily. And one of their false doctrines was the fact that uh, they would lord over the congregation like a dictator. And uh, they exploited people with false doctrines. And I, I you know, that's, that's going on today. This one guy gets on the satellite and he talks about selling holy water. There's no such thing as holy water in the Bible. Now we've watched too much TV. They take it and throw it on the vampire and it burns him and all that, you know. It's... <laughs> It's, written, it's not in the Bible. But people like these fables. So they, had, they departed from true doctrine and brought in false doctrine in order to control, use leverage, manipulate the congregation, mainly for money. Now that's going on today. Wouldn't you say that? That's going on today. You send me $100 and I promise you a hundredfold return. You know, well I can't promise you a hundredfold return. I don't know if you're a tither to start with. See? You don't get into that, but they're, it's like gambling. Spiritual gambling. And a lot of people desperately send in money to these guys and they haven't got a hundredfold return yet. So that's one problem, exploiting the people for money. That's what they were doing. All right, now verse 7, of course, the promises to the overcomer. You got anything you want to say on these seven verses that I maybe didn't mention? How do we overcome? By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. All right, that's the first church. We'll go on to the second church now, the church of what? Smyrna. Let's go in my Bible here. It's paraphrased or paragraph 8 to 11. Second church. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye might be tried and you shall have tribulation ten days. Mm -hmm. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. All right. What would you, according to the Bible, what is the second death? Well, the second death occurs after the second resurrection, and those whose Names are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That's right. But the child of God will never go there. Right. No. Won't even be in that judgment. Let me rephrase that. The overcoming child of God will never go there. Right. So we'll study that in Revelation chapter 20 when we get there in great detail. Okay. Now let's go back and go over this again in the 8th verse. Uh, it describes... Really, the Lord and the Creator as one with total and, and, and complete control. I must accept that. Complete control. Even the Bible talks about He sets up and He tears down. He has His way with nations. You know, the heathen, uh, 
nothing really goes on on this earth that God doesn't know about. And he allows certain things. He doesn't have to tell us why, but he has the final say about everything on this planet. If he didn't, he wouldn't be all powerful. Now we have a teaching that says that we're in control. Well, if I'm in control, then we're making one whale of a mess. You see what I'm saying? No, it's been prophesied what's going to happen in the last days, and it can't be changed. And a lot of it's bad news to someone that's not right with God. That's right. And, you know, Jesus, when he was here and he, he was talking to the one uh, uh, soldier who'd came to him, you know, for healing, mm -hmm. he said, you can have no authority except you be under authority. So how could we be in charge? We have to be under authority. Well, we have a certain, we have a certain uh, amount of authority in the kingdom of God. But it's delegated. It's delegated. From the one that we're yeah. under. We're not, <laughs> we're not God. Everybody say we're not God. All right, yeah. so. All right, the ninth verse. The Jews that reject Christ are not considered Jews, but the synagogue of Satan. Now, I know we're on fighting grounds here. Because it's taught today, well, God loves everybody. It's conditional. I mean, His love is unconditional, but to be accepted of the Lord, that's conditional. And these Jews in this particular church rejected Christ. At least some of them did. And that allowed Satan to come in there and set up headquarters. Now, that's a bad... How would you like to go to that church? I mean, it's bad news. So... What it results in is worship outside of Christ and is considered satanic. Could you imagine belonging to a church that God says is satanic? But yet if you start probing on doctrine and probing on what is believed by the clergymen in the local church, I would say a good majority without exception are satanic. Like control, manipulation, which is the spirit of Jezebel, and we'll get that in just a minute, maybe. All right, let's see. All right, in verse 10, Rome persecuted this church for about 200 years. And as Brother Monty talked about in verse 11, about the second death. Now, it's hard to be nice when we're, we're, we're studying this, because I know of a denomination right now that teaches... If a person dies and their soul goes to, the, to hell, it burns up and ceases to exist. You ever hear of that? Yeah, I've heard that, the false doctrine of soul sleep. Well, it's more than soul sleep. Uh, they teach soul sleep, uh, sleeping in Jesus. I heard that in the funeral this week. Now, if we physically die, we don't sleep in Jesus. The physical body sleeps in Jesus. The inner man goes to heaven. Well, we'll see later on where, yeah. where John saw the souls of those that had been martyred mm -hmm. underneath the altar. And they were, they were crying out, how long, O oh Lord? So they weren't mm -hmm. non-existent or no, sleeping. No, they weren't sleeping. No, 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 it was the bodies that were sleeping in the grave. But see, what they're saying is that if, if a person is resurrected after the millennium and they go to the lake of fire, it is an eternal punishment. It's, uh, they, they cease to exist after punished for a few minutes, and that's what they teach. Well, they can People twist like the, to hear that, but it's not correct. They can twist the scripture if they want, but I'm going to believe what it says. Well, you know what? The Lord gave us a warning about the Revelation book. If we add to or take away anything, we're in danger of getting our name blotted out of the book. And I'm just not going to do it. I mean, the crowd might get really small, but then I'd rather get into heaven <laughs> and please the Lord as to have a big crowd and not please the Lord. So, and What's wrong with proper doctrine anyway? Nothing. It's good, isn't it? Yes, it is. We need to know that we know. Now, more light comes as we grow in grace. You understand that, but the basics we can all understand, I think, tonight. Now, the 12th verse through uh, 17, Brother Monty, the third church is Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things hath he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast mm -hmm. not denied my faith. 
even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, Mm -hmm. to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Yes, we all have a new name tonight. Back to verse 12 now. Uh, This sword that goes out of the mouth is the Word of God. Right? It's the Word of God. 13... uh, We have Satan joined to this church and trouble inside the church. You know, I just don't like church trouble, do you? No. I've never rejoiced over it. No. As long as you have people, you're going to have some problems. And it's okay to have some problems as long as we work it out based on the Word of God. But when you have people that refuse to conform to God's will, then we're going to have a spiritual problem in the church. And Satan takes advantage of that. He moves in and sets up headquarters inside the church. Actually, he wants behind the pulpit. If Satan could get the pulpit, then he's pretty well got the pew. Well, in this this, uh, town of Pergamos, there was a a temple there to an idol that uh, they referred to as the Savior. In other words, it was Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. And they also had uh, a group of uh, Babylonian priests that had settled there, mm-hmm. and I, from from what I've read, it was it was uh, you know the church had just gotten too friendly with these pre- with these Babylonian priests and mm-hmm. with these idolaters, and like you said, then they wanted behind the pulpit of the church. Well, they got into spiritual adultery, and all of these churches. When we're talking about idolatry, it's always involving sex sins, always. And we need to realize that spiritual fornication is worshiping other gods, but then it trickles down to immorality within the church. And then we get into the homosexual thing, the whole nine yards, and uh, I was talking to one man that said one of his friends left this church in Oklahoma because they were accepting gays now, I understand that, but you see, we can't turn them away. We've got to give them a chance, right? God wants to give them a chance to repent. If they'll repent and get out of that lifestyle, I don't have a problem with them coming to church. But sad to say, most of the ones that I've seen, they go back into it for some reason. So it's a spirit that gets a hold of people and actually probably should be cast out of people. Um, but they've got to want to get out of that lifestyle. And it, 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 all these churches have had this problem. And if they refuse to repent, they have no place in the church because once they get in the church, they start trying to proselytize uh, Christians over into their beliefs. Well, they can bring a bad spirit into the congregation, see. And that, that's with any of these sins that people refuse to repent over, it allows Satan to move in and set up headquarters. There's only one thing you have to preach this stuff out of the church. That's the way God does it. And uh, you know if you're under a preacher when you hear them come against these things. But uh, this was tolerated among other uh, sins and the Lord was upset. So notice they didn't have the deeds of the, of the, of the Ephesians but the doctrine. Doctrine, not the deeds, as the Ephesian church. So this church had devolved from the deeds to the doctrine, I should say. And that's the way it works. People start off doing things, then it, it gets, they make their own rules. See? Make their own regulations. 
Now, how many churches do you know, Brother Monty, that's got, <laughs> got this big list of thou shall nots on the door, and if you want to be a member, then you've got to say that you're going to keep all these rules and regulations, and the clergy knows you can't do it, and now you're under condemnation, and you're trying to measure up, and you can't do it, and uh, how many churches are like that? Oh, I know several. Mm -hmm. and I won't call names tonight. We're on these seven right now, but I'm saying we have these problems today, and the Lord's not, not pleased with them. Okay, now, another thing about this church, they had unscriptural church government, unscriptural church government, exploiting the people, and they left the cross again. Now, unscriptural church government was in this church, and God hates that. For example, you know, I'm on dangerous grounds again tonight. For example, could you show me anywhere in the Bible, New Testament, where the congregation votes on the under shepherd? Now, they did choose seven men full of the Holy Ghost and faith for deacons, but they still had to bring them to the apostles for approval. So you see how God operates this thing. Now, I would say when a pastor is voted in to be the pastor of the church, they're appointed by men and not by God. I just need scripture to start. I'm not saying there's something wrong with the vote of confidence, but usually it splits the church because some like the pastor, some doesn't. And really, you don't have a choice. If, if, you're, if God sets you under a certain ministry, then that's it. You have to love them. You have to love your pastor. <laughs> you don't have to like them, but you have to love them. All right? No. I heard of one vote. They couldn't get a majority on, this, on, a, on a new pastor. Mm -hmm. So one of the ladies in the minority stood up and said, Well, it's obvious that the majority of this church can't hear from God like we do. Ooh. That's a good church trouble. <laughs> I'm thinking back now in one of those Assembly of God churches that uh, years ago that they had a vote on the pastor and some of the folks couldn't be there and so the pastor's wife had a little piece of paper and she wrote, you know, yay or nay on it and put it in the basket and she didn't get the okay of the people that she was voting for. I'd say that's craftiness and dishonesty in the clergy. Now, how can God bless that? He can't. These are little things we'll deal with, but, you know, it's the same principle as what was going on here in these churches. And it can, it can escalate to a church split tie. A church split. Now, I'm going to say this boasting in the Lord. 30 years and never had a church split because they don't stay long enough to... <laughs> To cause, to cause a ruckus. I always preach the troublemakers out. Amen. Now I feel if I can't preach you out, you're called to be here. Praise the Lord. That's just, it's, it's worked for 30 years. It, it's worked. We're yes. not a big church, but we are an overcoming church. Praise the Lord. So that's what matters, right? Well, why, would we wanna, why would we want to have 200 people here if, if, if 100 of them weren't, called, weren't put here by the Lord? If they weren't the sheep of this pasture? It's serious because you've got a hundred over here that want contemporary music and a hundred over here that want the old time gospel hour. And then we've got to have two church services because one, you know, traditional and one contemporary. All right, that's enough rambling. Let's go on down to verse 18. Let's get the next church here. Now, folks, we're not even just scratching the surface, okay? But um, the Lord will give us what we need. Hopefully we'll throw out enough tidbits to get spark you. your interest to get into yeah. studying. 18 to the rest of the chapter. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, which the last to be more than the first, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Mm -hmm. 
And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Yes. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, mm -hmm. I will put upon you none other burden but that, but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, mm -hmm. even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Yes, amen. In verse 18, the Catholic Church began at about uh, 500 A.D. And unfortunately, brought in some idolatry into what we call the church today. Um, if I understand how God is, and I, and I think I'm sure that we, I do, um, He must judge idolatry. You know, we don't pray to Mother Mary. Do we? Jesus had, doesn't have to go through Mother Mary. Mary's not co redemptor with Christ. She had to be saved like any other sinner. I know that's fighting words, but it's true. Now, so the Catholic Church is still in existence today, and, and frankly, and they'll cut this out, but you know, I don't think Catholics are saved until they get born again. Because the Pope can't forgive their sins. And they're under idolatry and this and that. And they're good people. I, I had some friends that was Catholic. But uh, he was a born again Catholic. And uh, my thinking on that line is that how can you stay in this when you really are born again? And his answer was he's going to stay in there to witness to people this and that. Well, it doesn't work very well because we're in a system that, that really says they're following Jesus, but it might be another Jesus. Now, uh, I don't want to bash them too much because they're not here to defend their doctrine, but uh, the Eucharist is not literal. It doesn't turn into the body and blood of Christ, and they think if you don't take that, you're not saved because you haven't ate His body and drank His blood. Now, we're not into cannibalism. So you see, you see how serious it can get. Because really, we're sacrificed Christ every time we take communion, according to their doctrine. Yeah, and the scriptures are very clear that he was sacrificed once. Once and for all. Not repeatedly as the animal sacrifices were. And, and basically, that, that doc, their doctrine of the Eucharist mm -hmm. reduces it back down to the point where he's sacrificed every time they partake. Which basically is blasphemy. Yes. That'd be like one of us bringing a little lamb in here, and we're going to sacrifice that thing. No, Jesus was our Lamb of God. He, he was our sacrifice. God gave the sacrifice for us. We don't have to do that anymore. And that's good news. But you see, this church now got off into works. Now, how many churches, it's just working, 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 doing all these wonderful things, but they begin to trust in their, what they're doing, their works, rather than faith in Christ, and they can leave the cross with good intentions of doing something for God, but their, their faith is sidetracked. So I'm trying to get people back, their faith back into Jesus and Him crucified, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the faith. We should have good works, but good works won't give you faith. Faith allows you to produce good works. It's called fruit. Now in verse 20, they, they got into spiritual fornication, and they, they actually forsook Christ and... His way of salvation. Now that's a serious thing. Let's look at this again, verse 20, uh, in case I'm missing something here. I have a few things against you because you allow that, you suffer that woman Jezebel. Now everybody say Jezebel. Jezebel. Do you like that name, Jezebel? 
No. She was an actual person, but now we're talking about a system or a spirit that's got into the church. And it, it, it causes people to turn away from Jesus into a good work or something of that and to sidetrack their faith and shipwreck them, really. So the pastor was allowing this to go on, and so, boy, it's bad news. And this is not referring directly to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. This no, is referring no, no, no. to a, a woman that was there mm -hmm. at, at John's time in yeah. that church. Now, she may have had the same spirit, the same, you know, the same spirit that Jezebel had, but it's exactly. not the same woman, and, and the scriptures are not going back in time here. They're still yeah. at the present time when John wrote this. Well, when Jezebel painted her face and all that in the Old Testament there, it's a picture of a religious system that is fake. It's not really visible until you start probing and checking out the doctrine. And then Jezebel gets upset. I mean, Jezebel is the one that splits the church. It causes division and schisms in the body of Christ. God doesn't do that. So it's got to be another spirit. And, 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 and frankly, uh, she was uh, calling herself a prophetess. Now everybody's prophets and apostles today. But, uh, and she taught her servants to commit fornication. That's spiritual fornication. Now the other was going on. See, the, 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 the physical part was the fornication of adultery was also going on. But the spiritual fornication, God really gets upset with that because now they're worshiping another deity and there is no other deity other than Jehovah God. All right, so God won't tolerate that. He gives them space to repent, but apparently they did not. We know it's idolatry and, and spiritual fornication because the last part of that verse says, thing is sacrificed to idols. See? That goes along with this uh, idolatry. They had to sacrifice things. Now today we're not supposed to eat anything that's been offered to a false god. That's in effect. When you read the book of Acts, there were three requirements to be a church member. Abstain from blood, things sacrificed to idols, and fornication, meaning spiritual fornication, and physical fornication. All right? Fornication also means devil worship. It's all tied in, this blood sacrifice and everything. But that's, that's what they were getting into. And I don't know how far a church can fall to get into this stuff, but that's what happened. Okay. What verse was that? 20? That was 20. All right, 21, salvation by works. I just wrote a note down here, salvation by works. We find that in every cult. Boy, I hate to have to sit here and say this church was a cult. No, it wasn't a cult, but it had some of the makings of a cult. Every cult says you can get to heaven by good works. Every single one without exception. And then they control you to do the good works for them. Not God. They use it to manipulate people. And, and I believe that when you get into manipulation, you're dabbling in witchcraft. It's a Jezebel spirit. You see, it's not the clergy's responsibility to control anybody. You're led by the Spirit. We're not to be lords over God's flock. We're to be good examples to them. So that's how you know. You're free to do whatever you want. We're dealing with volunteers. But you need to know what God wants and then just do that because you love Him. That's, it's easy. 22, this is in the future, verse 22. Let's check this again now. Okay, great tribulation. You want to get on that a little bit? Great tribulation. I think he's referring to the seven-year tribulation here. Absolutely. So we definitely know that this characteristic is in the church today, and we're heading toward great tribulation. The good news is the overcoming church will escape it. And I know that's fighting words with false doctrine people. But the true doctrine is the blessed hope of the church where we escape. And we will find that blessed hope of the church actually taking place in chapter 4 of this book. Therefore, it's all future. Now you've got to get that in your mind. It's all future. Two and three today. After the rapture, it's all future. 
But rapture comes in chapter 4. Therefore, it must be all future. Every bit of it, without exception. Even though there are some things that lapse back to a happening in the past, and it seems like it's talking about that. But the rapture hadn't occurred yet, so therefore it must be in the future. And one thing to pay attention to is the blessings to the overcomers. Because when we get to chapter 4, we're going to see a group of people seated around the throne that have those blessings, that, that have inherited those blessings at that time. Okay. So, so pay attention to, to these blessings for the overcomers. It'll come in handy later. That's your homework. All right. Then verse 23 is talking about true works that proclaim the fruit of the Spirit. We've had so much teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, and that's okay, but I think fruit's more important than the gifts. Because actually, gifts of the Spirit is not an evidence to anyone that you're right with God. Fruit is an evidence that you're right with God. Like love, joy, <laughs> things like that, see. So, religion deals with the fruit of the problems rather than the root of the problems. They'll never... Oh, boy. There's a church down in Texas that will never, ever preach against sin. You know who I'm talking about. Never deal with the problem. Just skim over it all and go to something positive. There can be no positive without the negative taken care of first. You try to start your car and you don't have that Battery cable on the negative, it won't, it won't start, well, it might. Because it takes two, a positive and a negative, to run the, start the car. And so it does with a child of God. We've got to deal with the problems. And, and any preacher that refuses to call black, black, and white, white, good, good, bad, bad, light, light, dark, dark, he's not right with God. Well, you're judging. Well, I'm expecting, inspecting the fruit here. I see a lot of flesh stuff, but I don't see much truth from God's Word being espoused. Amen. And yet we've got thousands of people flocking in there and supporting it, but there's no gospel. If you preach only the positive and don't deal with the negative, and bring them to repentance, then you're just whitewashing a sepulcher. Well, let me ask you a question, Brother Monty. Is it possible to bring somebody to true repentance and conversion without preaching against sin? No. Well, how are they getting saved? They may not be. If they, if, they, if they don't know, if they aren't taught what sin is and taught that they need to repent from it, then, then they've never repented and they can't be regenerated. But they've joined the church. They're accepted in the church as believers. Mm -hmm, but that doesn't save you. No. Do we know any churches like that in our country? Does anybody out there know any churches like that? I think you do if you, if you check things out. That There's a lot of those that are trusting in everything except Christ and Him crucified. And that's the only way to be saved. I'm going to say that again. That's the only way to be saved. Is to accept the provisions of the cross of Calvary for our salvation. There are no other ways to be saved. Any other way is a broad road that leads to destruction. And many of there be which go in there at what Jesus said. I used to think the broad road was the world, but now I, I, I'm convinced that it, it, it is a false way of salvation that leads people away from God. That's a terrible thing because some people want God. They, they're looking. They, they want to get right. But yet they go into these churches and this is taught and think, well, this must be what it is. And so they accept that and then they, they're, they're not right. It's a terrible thing. It ought to upset every single one of us. Amen. If we're like God, we're going, to hate, we're, we're, we're going to hate evil. And Satan doesn't come in here with a pitchfork and horns. He comes in here as an angel of light, going to tell us what the Word of God says. And that's what happened in these churches. And he moved in and set up headquarters, and they went down. Now, The burden of verse 24 was to oppose Jezebel teachings. I want to know how many preachers we've got in this country 
that's got enough Holy Ghost power to stand up and oppose every wrong way. How many have we got, money? Tell me. No, probably wouldn't have to count too high. <laughs> Give me a guess, please. Nah. <laughs> Anybody want to guess out there? Well, just get out and about, and you'll find out pretty quick that, uh, you know, we've got trouble, and it's all been prophesied to be that way. But verse 25, hold to the cross, keep faith, and the rapture of the church. Keep faith in the rapture of the church and Jesus. Now, verse 26, it was talking about um, holding fast. That, that doesn't mean to hold fast to our good works. It means to hold fast to Christ's work. You getting that? Because when we stand before God, we're not going to say, well, I did all these wonderful things, you know, and I, I, I give to the poor, and I evangelize, and I, I gave money, and I, I give time and all this. We don't hold to that. We hold to what Jesus did for us. Because we can't be accepted on our own good works. We're accepted by the good works of Jesus. So we're, we're holding to that. We're holding to what he did. That's the faith. We don't hold to what all we've done with our life. We hold to what he did with his life. That's Christ's end. Amen. Now verse 27 is a controversial thing here. and um, Now let's look at it real close. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. We're, now we're talking about the future millennium, the thousand year reign in this verse. And verse 26, he that overcomes and keeps my works to, to the end, uh, I will give him power over the nations. Now, we know that Jesus is number one here, that he, he kept everything that God required, and he has power over the nations. Isn't that right? But what we don't understand is that we, we have power over the nations, because the next verse says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, who are we talking about? He or are we talking about the overcomer? We're talking about both. Because we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Yeah, a apart from him, we could not rule and reign. No. So it has to be both. Us in him. Yeah, so in verse 27, the pronoun he is not capitalized, and that's correct. Because he, or I could say we, shall rule with a rod of iron. So, the Bible's teaching that you're all going to be the boss. And some of you need to get with it, or God's going to make you come back here and rule over Stella, Missouri. And I don't want that. I don't want to rule over New York either, so I don't know. Whatever the Lord wants, maybe we'll get a planet, you think? It's possible. They're out there for some reason. Yeah. It will be a wonderful time. And we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years and eternity as the revelation teaches and in the future we'll get to that. Now chapter 3. Hallelujah. Let's go uh, 1 to 8 and we'll speed it up here. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Mm -hmm. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold <clears throat> fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Mm -hmm. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Yes. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, let's go back to verse 1 now. The uh, seven spirits of God, people are hung up on that. And uh, we know that God only has one spirit, so you want to comment on that one? I think a, a, a translation we would have understood better uh, in, in today's language would have been 
uh, if they'd referred to the Holy Spirit as the sevenfold spirit. Mm. Seven, characteristics. Yes, the, yeah. the characteristics, sevenfold, mm -hmm. uh, representing the perfect and complete spirit. Yes, yeah. the Holy Spirit himself. So there, are no, there, there cannot be seven spirits of God. But some teach there are. Yeah, but it's just one spirit, and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's referring to the characteristics uh, and attributes mm -hmm. of the spirit there. That's right. All right, so they're going to overcome by faith in Christ. Now, verse 5, um, he will not be blotted out of the book, blot out his name out of the book of life. That tells us that it's possible for a person's name to be blotted out of the book, doesn't it? So a person could stop being a Christian and, and lose their salvation and be blotted out of the book of life. So they turn to another gospel and another way of salvation. And God says, if you don't repent, He's going to blot your name out of the book. Actually, He would have no choice because they left their first love. Right. And we got to hold to Christ no matter what. We still have a free will even after we get saved. We can reject Christ just as in the same manner that we received Christ. So once we come to the door of salvation, then God doesn't shut the door. No. It's still open and we can go back. I can't imagine why anyone would want to. No. And but they did. Mm -hmm. And actually the pastor, um, the seven pastors were the seven stars and they were dead spiritually. You know, in the ministry, we've got to be careful because we can get so, I mean, there's, there's a thousand different things that hit you. And if you're not real careful, and if a church doesn't pray for the pastor, then you can backslide. And then we begin to compromise. Oh, we still go through the motions. We know when to say amen, when to say hallelujah, know when to do the little dance, speak a few tongues, you know, but... You can backslide by getting too busy for God. And I teach this. God's first, family second, church third. But there are those, not all the churches. Now wait, the church didn't die on the cross for us. Right? So God's first, the family is second, and the church is third, and then your job's fourth. <laughs> You get that out of order, you're going to get in a problem. That's sad to say, but I've seen ministers, pastors of churches that lost their families and ended up in divorce because they put the church above their family. No. God's will is for the family to be involved in the church. And I'll even say this, your family is not complete if you're not joined to the church. No, your family is not whole if you're not part of a local church that's New Testament style. Just something missing because God set it up for the family to be part of the church. Right? But God and Christ is the head of the family. And if that's correct, and it, it is, then they come into the church and we don't have a problem. The problem we have with people coming into the church is that they don't have God first in their life. And they're going to come in here and... Uh, you know, they, they've got to repent and get God first in their life. And if God is first in our lives, then the church will be right up there in priority of importance. Right along with the family. Um, but when we get sidetracked, see, now I ask people when they move, okay, where are you going to go to church? Who's going to be the pastor? Do you know where you're going to go to church? No, we just got a job. No, wait. You can find a job if you seek and pray, but you can't find a proper church until God shows you where to go. That's right. You can go down to big mega uh, city and you're going to be hard pressed to find the right church. Because we can't go by a big fancy building or equipment or, or a big crowd, our talents and abilities. We've got to go by proper doctrine. I've got to get that across to people. Because without proper doctrine, you don't have anything. Doctrine keeps the devil out of the church. You let down the wall of, of sound doctrine, and that devil comes right in, and you can't stop him. 
because it's not being preached, it's not being believed, it's not being upheld by the pastor or the congregation. Now we're going to get a demon problem. Well, without proper doctrine, a church just devolves into a social club. We don't have any social clubs in this country, Brother Monty. They're all good gospel preaching churches. Every single one of them, right? Wrong. That's a, that <laughs> confession of faith. I wished it was true, but it's just not true. So, this was going on in this church, and we have it today. Now, now 7 through 13, the sixth church. Praise the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia... Right, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that mm -hmm. hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Yes. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept my, the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write yes. upon him my new name. Amen. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. The sixth church of Philadelphia. Jesus is telling them in verse 7 that he has total authority. Now, I must accept that because the last chapter in uh, Matthew 28, Jesus said he had all power in heaven and in earth. What a statement. And yet, he's telling this church the very same thing. I have total authority. Amen. Now, in the eighth verse, uh, the door was uh, for the spreading of the gospel, basically. And... I take heart here and I, I uh, encourage myself because this church was small in number. Small in number. They weren't a mega anything. Yet they had a little strength in Jesus' eyes. Yeah. So it's not the size of the crowd that, that really matters. It's the, get this now, it's the spiritual content of the folks. Spiritual contents, what God's looking for. He's not looking for a bunch of numbers. Even though he wants everybody to be saved, we know not everyone will be saved because most are going to reject Christ in the cross. Even most of the church today, oh God help me now, most of the church today is rejecting Christ in the cross. They're, they're preaching all different ways to get to God. There's only one way to get to God, and you know what that is. That Jesus is the way of truth and life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. And they say, well, God's building some bridges today, you know. No, those bridges don't go anywhere. They all got to come through Calvary, or God's going to reject every single attempt to get right with Him. That's true. I don't care how big the church is, how much money they got. They're weak. Actually, they're naked. We'll get to that next one, and... Uh, We've got this materialistic church, and, and I, I like things, but, you know, things don't, doesn't denote spirituality. If it did, well, then I guess Hollywood's pretty spiritual, huh? Well, the big churches are required to preach the same gospel as the small churches. Same message, very same message. Amen. And it's a good message. It's the only message that God approves of. So they were a small congregation, and... But a few could take the gospel to the entire world. Now you got to think about that. A few can touch the world with the gospel. Verse 9. 
God does not at any time recognize national Israel because national Israel, for the most part, listen, has rejected Christ. Now, he has a plan for national Israel in the future. After the rapture, God begins to deal with the Jews again and bring them back into covenant. Yes, he does. But right now, during the church age, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That's right. Uh, an Israelite will have to be saved the very same way as a Gentile does today, and that's faith in Jesus and the cross. God will accept no law keeping. Amen. Well, even, even in the Old Testament, it was their faith in the coming Messiah that saved them. Mm -hmm. But in the coming kingdom age now, after the great tribulation to come, uh, Israel will bow to Christ and God will restore national Israel to their proper place in His prophetic plan. The scripture says that uh, all of Israel will, uh, yeah. will accept Him and be saved. So all of Israel is going to be saved in one day. How's that possible? <laughs> well, when Christ comes back on the white horse in Revelation 19, they're all going to see him come back. And they're all going to be saved. That one and day. during the Great Tribulation, all of the, all of the ones with hard hearts that are unrepentant will be killed, killed off. off. So yeah. only, only those who are willing to accept the Messiah will be alive at his return. That's right. But when Israel said, we have no king but Caesar, his blood be on us and on our children, do you realize how much they've suffered? Hitler's Holocaust is a picnic compared to the coming Great Tribulation. When right after the rapture, one billion people estimated will die. One billion. Terrible thing. Our only hope is to get out of here. But the overcomer will. That's the promise of God, and I accept it. Can I have an amen? We accept it. Praise the Lord. And we're getting out in verse 10. Verse 10, let's look at it. 10, can you read it again for me, please? Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come right. upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Mm -hmm. so, so that's that, the rapture. Yeah. The hour of temptation is the great tribulation that lasts seven years. What did Jesus say? He would keep us from keep that. Keep us from it. Not through it, from it. Now, but listen, though. There are those that teach in the modern day church that we go through that hour of temptation. But Jesus said he'd keep us from going through it. Which means we must be resurrected, raptured before it starts. That's right. And yet there are preachers that say there's not one scripture that says we're going to be raptured. He don't know his Bible. He shouldn't even be a minister. Is that too rough? Because he's deceiving people. And what they'll say is, well, the church has got to get ready to meet God. <laughs> I want to tell everybody something. If the blood is not going to do it, then we're not going to make it. Now, that's, a, that's believing in our works rather than the blood of Christ. Which is the makings of a cult. Right? right. Works. Uh, this purging thing. We've got to face all this trouble and suffer. Well, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus suffered for us? Yes, it does. So why should we have to suffer? Can I add anything to salvation? No. Is not. there one thing we can do to help? Not a one of us can add anything to what Christ did on the cross. And if we try, Brother Money, we will wind up cursing ourselves. Yeah. God can, re He must reject every attempt to add to His salvation plan. And yet, if you join the church, you'll be saved. You know, we should join the church, but not for salvation. No, as a result of salvation. And what about water baptism? That should be the result of salvation. You mean we can't get baptized and join the church and be saved? No. you got to be Didn't saved Didn't we cover that here a while back? But how many churches do you know that teach that? Well, they were baptized into Christ back in 1960. No, water baptism don't baptize anybody into Christ. 
But you see, all this stuff we have to deal with, and they had the same problem. Another gospel. And there is no other gospel, the Apostle Paul said. John backs it up, and, and Jesus actually gets on to the church. But what I don't like about this is he's getting on the pastor first. You know, things roll downhill, folks. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, we're in a good mood, aren't we? Are we raps are ready tonight? Praise the Lord. I know one thing. We are living in chapter 2 and chapter 3. There's no doubt yes, about that. Yes, we are. So that's where we are right now in God's timetable. Okay, let's go to uh, the last church now, and we're going to quit here as uh, Laodicea Lukewarm Church, 14 to 22. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So, when, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, mm -hmm. and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, yeah. that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, yes. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To mm -hmm. him that overcometh will I grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Now back to 14, we're talking about an apostate church. An apostate church is one that apostatizes. Would you like to elaborate on what apostasy might mean, Brother Lloyd? Well, apostasy is, is just turning away from the truth, falling back from it, drawing back from it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think here it's because of just apathy, uh, laziness in, in studying the word. Uh, trusting in their works. Trusting in their works. Self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, you know, many of the things that we see around us today and that we have to guard for even in our congregation. Yes, sir. So we understand these principles in that the Lord is, is bringing out here. After the church apostatizes, now I know this is against a lot of teachings in the Pentecostal church. And we're taught there's going to be a big outpouring of the Holy Ghost and a great revival. People have always been getting saved, okay? God's always been doing something in every generation. So it's going to be a revival plus apostasy at the same time. So we've got the remnant church getting fired up for God, and we've got the apostate church getting more cold and lukewarm. And they're not going to make it. No. So the, the, the revival has to come, but also a sign before the rapture is that the church apostatizes and turns from the cross and begins to hold to other ways of salvation. And there is no other way of salvation other than Jesus him crucified. The rapture comes after that. Pastor, if you put a bite of food in your mouth, is it in your body? Not yet. Well, if you close your lips around it. Do I get to swallow part of it? or? Well, I suppose you could. I suppose I would, spew could mean vomit as well as just spit out. I would say if a person is going to be spewed out of the mouth, they must be in the body of the stomach in order to get out of the mouth, wouldn't you? So, so I mean, this doctrine here shows that those that are being spewed out have to be in the body first before they can be spewed out. Well, of course out. they're in the body. They're in the church. Yeah. <laughs> And here's the sad part, folks, and I, I'm not rejoicing over this. They were right with God at one time. Yeah. And yet we're taught, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, wait a minute. Can I ask some scripture? 
I mean, that's not in a parable form. Can I have, can I have several scriptures that, that, you know, those are a few. But on the other side of this thing, there's a whole lot of them that warn about this. You can backslide to the point that getting your name blotted out of the book. Now, if that's not lost, but they were saved. They were. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been in that book to start with. And one of my, my, my ministry friends, uh, he said that Judas was never saved. Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Judas was an apostle with authority from Christ. And Acts chapter 1 says that Judas fell. Everybody say fell. fell. Judas fell and went to his appointed place, which was hell. The reason Judas went to hell, he betrayed the Lord, but he went out and committed suicide. And that's all she wrote. He went to hell. But he was right with God at one time. At one time he was. It's a terrible thing. I, just, I don't like to see people backslide and get away. And wonder if they were to die in that condition. So it's just not worth gambling over. We just need to keep right with God and proper doctrine and obedience to the Word of God is the only way we're going to do it. It's imperative that it's taught to us just like it is. Amen. All right, let's see. Um, let's go to 17. That This church is, is looking at material blessings, not spiritual blessings. Now, I believe in prosperity, don't you? But we can take it to the extreme here. And then after we, we get real prosperous, we can step back and say, well, you know, God's blessed us with this and that. Well, the world can dish out the money. That's true. So Satan can. In fact, the devil told Jesus when he was tempted there in the wilderness, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms and everything in it. Jesus didn't say you can't do that, devil. Right? But that's... God wants to prosper us, but that doesn't necessarily denote spirituality. This, this church had all the goods, and Jesus said they were miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. Had nothing. Does that sound like the church today a little bit, perhaps? I think so. All right, verse 20 now, and we're closing here, is very something that's very disturbing to me. Because we got Jesus outside the church knocking trying to get in his church terrible scenario back in back when we first started studying this he was in the midst of the church and now by now the time we get here he's he's outside the church wanting to get back in boy oh boy and you know he's outside of the heart of the people they pushed him out mm -hmm. and accepted another Christ, another. In fact, the Jews are going to accept the wrong Messiah. They're looking for him to come right now. They'll accept the Antichrist. And he comes in chapter 6. But we have, by the grace of God, accepted the one true Messiah, the Lord Jesus himself. Praise God. All right, so Jesus is outside the church. The church made another door. And the church rejects the Lord. But right now, today, this is the important thing as we shut this thing down tonight. This is the important thing, that Jesus deals with individuals today, not congregations as a whole. Individuals make up congregations, but you can't be saved by being in a congregation. We're not tribal right now. We're not like the Jews used to be. God deals with individuals, and so... If a church has pushed Jesus, if, if, if a church has pushed Jesus outside the door and he's knocking trying to come back in, then people inside that congregation have pushed Jesus out of their lives, and he's trying to get back into their lives individually first. And if we'll allow the Lord to come in individually and take control, then he'll be back in the church and not knocking on the outside trying to get in. Praise God.